The human evolutionary story is one with many twists and turns in its narrative, both how it played out and how we understand the evidence of it. The field of paleoanthropology as a whole, therefore, is full of mysteries that are still yet to be solved, as well as plenty of controversies regarding taxonomy, culture, and who we are as a species of ape ourselves. The central figures in all of this were a species known as Homo erectus, a name meaning upright man, and aptly so. This species has been a source of much contention and study of the nearly 130 years they've been known, with the species overall being one of the main discussion points of the field. Their complicated taxonomy, coupled with a potentially massive range, and time span of existence, means that much of what we know about some of our earliest ancestors can be quite the puzzling, but nonetheless fascinating, endeavour. The first remains of what were to be associated with this species, known as Javaman, were described by Dutch anatomist Eugene de Boy in 1893, who set out to look for the missing link, a now unscientific term between apes and humans in Southeast Asia, as he believed gibbons to be the closest living relatives to humans in accordance with the popular Out of Asia hypothesis of the time. Excavated from the bank of the Solo River at Trinor, East Java, the remains were allocated to the new genus Pithecanthropus erectus, the genus name having been coined by German zoologist Ernst Heichel in 1898 for an animal linked between humans and fossil apes, with the species name of erectus being given because the femur suggested that the Java man had been bipedal and walked upright. Later on, in 1921, two teeth from Zhoukodayan, China, discovered by Johan Andersen, had prompted further interest in the fossil apes of Asia, with the describer, Davidson Black, naming the remains as Sinanthropus pekinensis, commonly referred to as Peking Man, with subsequent excavations uncovering 200 human-like fossils from more than 40 individuals, including five nearly complete skull caps, although these remains were nearly all lost due to the outbreak of World War II, during an attempt to smuggle them out of China for safekeeping, although a few cars do still exist of some of the remains. The two genera would remain separate and largely undiscussed until 1950, when evolutionary biologist Ernst Mayer found that they were connected through a series of interbreeding populations, and coupled with their similarities, he reclassified both under the genus Homo. Throughout much of the 20th century, their role in human evolution was debated, as due to them being the first known vaguely human-like relatives proportionally known. It was presumed that modern humans first evolved in Asia, although a few naturalists like Charles Darwin theorised that chimpanzees and gorillas, humans' closest relatives, evolved and existed only in Africa, and that they must have spread out to Asia later on. As a part of the reclassification, Mayer not only lumped Sinanthropus and Pithecanthropus, but several other genera as synonyms, arguing that all human ancestors were part of a single genus, being Homo, and that never one more than one species of man existed on the Earth at any one time. This apparent revelation in taxonomy as it was known was quickly accepted, and shaped the field in the 1950s and well into the 1970s, until the African genus Australopithecus was accepted into the human evolutionary tree. This view of taxonomy, while now being outdated due to various oversights, bias, and other factors, the case of lumping different genuses that are not too dissimilar to one another, pre-described species has become more commonplace as time has gone on, which is relevant not only to hominins, but to other animal families as well, and this taxonomy will be relevant to Homo erectus later on in this video. Homo erectus, due to the earliest remains being dated to around 2 million years ago in the early Pleistocene epoch, are the oldest known early hominins to have possessed modern human-like body proportions, with relatively elongated legs and shorter arms compared to their torsos, evidence that they were predominantly terrestrial, being taller and more derived than the more basal Australopithecines, which have been described by some as more like gross old chimpanzees than modern humans. They also possessed a significantly larger body mass in comparison to early hominins such as early Homo and other Australopithecines, as whereas these animals typically ranged in weights from 29 to 48 kilograms, Homo erectus typically ranged anywhere from 52 to 63 kilograms, and 1.45 to 1.85 centimeters in height. It is possible that this increased body size was the result of life in a more open, savanna-like environment, where larger size gave the ability to exploit broader and more varied diets and or feeding areas increasing mobility and speed, as well as the ability to prey on larger animals and to better defend themselves. 
They also had a very similar limb configuration to modern humans, implying more human-like locomotion, with their shoulders also indicating high-speed throwing, something which will be useful in knowing how they would have hunted prey and survived. Like modern humans, and unlike many other great apes, there does not seem to have been much of a great size disparity between Homo erectus men and women, though there is not much fossil data regarding this. Because of being adapted to more hot and open environments, Homo erectus might have also been the earliest human species to have more naked skin and less dense hair covering, something supported by the increase in derived bipedal adaptations. If they did possess a more ape-like covering of body hair, sweating, the primary means through which modern humans prevent their brains and bodies from overheating, would not have been nearly as efficient, and interestingly, genetic analysis has found that high activity in the melocortin 1 receptor, which would produce dark skin, dated back 1.2 million years ago, well within the time of Homo erectus evolving. This could indicate the evolution of a less dense hair covering, as the lack of body hair would have left the skin exposed to harmful UV radiation. Homo erectus are also unique among early hominins to be the earliest known to possess a flatter face with a more prominent nose, as well as a larger brain case. The projecting nose is a trait which is generally thought to have evolved in response to breathing dry air in order to retain moisture, something key in a hotter and more open environment, as well as resulting in increased locomotion, including the ability to distinguish the direction of different smells, known as stereo olfaction to facilitate migration and navigation, which will be discussed soon enough in their hunting capabilities. The dimensions of a pelvis found from Ethiopia suggested that Homo ergaster, a close relative of, if not Homo erectus themselves, was found to be capable of birthing children with a maximal prenatal brain size of 315cc, about 30-50% to of adult brain size. This value falls intermediately between that of chimpanzees, 40%, and modern humans, 28%. Further conclusions can be made about the growth and development in early Homo from the Mojo Curso child, a 1.5 million year old, one year old Homo erectus, which had a brain at about 72 to 84% the size of an adult Homo erectus's brain, which suggests a brain growth trajectory more similar to that of other great apes than to modern humans. From this, it suggests that the prenatal growth of these hominins was similar to that of modern humans, but that the postnatal growth and development was intermediate between that of chimpanzees and modern humans, further emphasising their middle-of-the-road status as being human-like, but not quite all the way there in many aspects. This faster development rate, indicated by them being more developed at birth, suggests that altruciality, meaning an extended childhood, and therefore a longer period of dependency on your parents, evolved at a later stage in human evolution, possibly in the last common ancestor of Neanderthals and modern humans, which was likely to have been a population of Homo heidelbergensis, meaning that this faster development was indicative that the lifespan of Homo erectus would have been lower than that of later hominins, likely not getting past 30 in many cases. The skulls of these hominins are also readily different from modern humans, with the well-preserved specimen known as Turcanoboy being a prime example, with large brow ridges, a receding forehead, and projecting nasal bones being evident. The brain case of them is long and low, with a flat and receding forehead that merges at an angle with the brow ridge above their eyes, and their jaws noticeably project further outwards, and since the jaws often slant sharply backwards, they were likely chinless. The average brain size of Homo erectus is around 1000 cc, although markedly smaller specimens have been found that date back to 2 million years ago, with some only having a volume of 508 to 580 cc. The brain of the Turcanoboy specimen was almost fully grown at the time of their death, but the volume at 880 cc was only about 130 cc greater than the maximum found in Homo habilis, and about 500 cc below the average of modern humans. The 130 increase also becomes much less significant than what would be presumed when the larger body size is taken into account, although the CC of many individuals was indeed larger. Though Turcanoboy would have been no more than 12 years old when they died, the stature of them is more similar to that of a modern 15-year-old, and the brain being more comparable to that of a 1-year-old. So, by modern standards, they would have been more cognitively limited, though the invention of new tools proved that they were more intuitive than you would think, as we'll get into. The larger brains of Homo erectus were due to their energy requirements, needed more food and energy to survive. The change in diet to a more carnivorous one is evident in their bones, 
with analyses on the dental microwire and stable isotope chemistry, finding that they had a fairly flexible and diverse diet, which consisted primarily of animal protein, something that will be relevant to their culture and method of obtaining their foods. Dentally, they also had the thinnest enamel of any pleopleistocene hominin, with the mandibular bodies being somewhat thinner than those of early Homo, with the premolars and molars also having a higher frequency of pits than Homo habilis, suggesting Homo erectus ate more bristle foods, which causes pitting. This indicates that the Homo erectus mouth was less capable of processing hard foods, and was more useful at shearing through tougher foods, likely as a response to more sophisticated tool use, being able to access resources earlier relatives could not. Soon after the earliest remains of Homo erectus, the first major innovation in stone tool technology around 1.7 million years ago starts to appear. Known as the Ashland stone tools, which succeeded to the older one tools, they consist of the creation of large cutting tools like hand axes and cleavers, the first known which with their broader set of differing items for different niches, would have assisted them in a more competitive environment. Though many of the tools were large and heavy, these hand axes were sharper with more sophisticated chiseled edges, and they were likely multi-purpose tools, being used in a variety of activities from cutting up meats, digging out plants, or sharpening other tools. There is also a bone tool which was generally thought to have been invented by Stone Age humans, although instead dated back to the time of Homo erectus, the tool being the oldest known barbed bone point, an implement probably crafted out of a large animal rib around 800,000 years ago, from the Olduvai Gorge, which features three curved barbs and a carved tip. These points may have been used to hunt large prey on land, or they may have been used to catch fish, as the barbs would have held the slippery and struggling prey items in place, to then be swiftly killed. Ways in which the implementation of the item would have been used are however still unclear, as the barbed bone point has not yet been completed, and shows no sign of having been attached to a handle or shaft, as would be expected for such a weapon. This increase in weapon sophistication, which coincided with their increased brain size and high caloric intake from meat, indicates a much different lifestyle than their ancestors, a lifestyle that would have involved the hunting of large animals. Homo erectus sites are frequently associated with assemblages of medium to large size game, namely elephants, bovine, and boar, with their dependency on large animal meat being evident in the disappearance of the species from the Levant region in Africa, correlating with the local extinction of the straight tusked elephants, which, due to their size, would have been a staple food source. Nonetheless, Homo erectus diets likely varied wildly depending on the locality, as there have been cases of them gathering different types of fruits, vegetables and tubers, as well as birds and reptiles. Interestingly, they may have also been the first to use a hunting and gathering food collecting strategy as a response to the increasing dependence on meat, with the only fossil evidence regarding group composition coming from four sites in Kenya, where 97 footprints made 1.5 million years ago were likely left by a group of at least 20 individuals. One of these trackways, based on the size of the footprints, may have been an entirely male group, which could indicate if they were some specialised task group, such as a hunting or foraging party or a border patrol. If correct, this would also indicate sexual division of labour, which distinguishes human societies from those of other great apes and social mammalian carnivores. In modern hunter-gatherer societies who target large prey items, typically male parties are dispatched to bring down these high-risk animals, and due to the lower success rate, female parties focus on more predictable foods and smaller, less dangerous prey. Homo erectus are also notable as being the first human ancestors to have used fire, although the timing of this invention is debated, mainly because campfires very rarely preserve, and if they do, very poorly over long periods of time, let alone thousands or millions of years. The earliest claimed fire sites date back as far as 1.7 million years ago, with one being in Wonderwork Cave in South Africa. These first firekeepers are thought to have simply transported to caves and then maintained naturally occurring fires for extended periods of time or only sporadically when the opportunity arose. This has led to the proposed cooking hypothesis by Richard Rangham, which states that Homo erectus speciated from the ancestral Homo habilis because of fire usage and cooking, which would help to explain the rapid doubling of brain size between the two in a 500,000 year time span, coinciding with the sudden appearance of the typically human body plan. Cooking does make protein more easily digestible, speeding up nutrient absorption, and allowing group sizes to expand in the process. 
However, the fossil record of cooking through fire does not associate with the emergence of Homo erectus, and it likely did not become a common practice until after 400,000 years ago, when such cases became more abundant. It is possible, therefore, that fire starting was invented and lost and then reinvented multiple times, rather than being invented in one place and then spreading throughout the world. The main controversy surrounding the species comes from its convoluted relationship with other hominins, and how they are all related to one another. It has been proposed that Homo erectus came into existence as a species after evolving from Homo habilis in a rather linear way, with habilis going extinct and then erectus diversifying and so on, although the human evolutionary story is far from being that simple. Homo habilis actually did exist at the same time as Homo erectus, for at least half a million years in fact, although this doesn't refute them being descended from them entirely. Ancestral species can most definitely still exist at the same time and place as the descendant species do, and this is due to cladogenesis, where a population either becomes reproductively isolated, or finds a new niche in the environment, and then splits off to form a clade under the same genus. This means that while they may have evolved from Habilis, they did coexist with them, as well as alongside the genus Paranthropus, which appears to have outnumbered them 10 to 1 when Homo erectus first evolved 2 million years ago, as well as living alongside the even more basal Australopithecus sediba. They would eventually, however, outlive much of their competition, as climatic changes around this time suited the more generalised erectus than Paranthropus, which is also around the time they vanished from the fossil record. They are generally considered to have been the first species of hominin to have expanded beyond Africa, and to be spread over two continents, perhaps including Europe, and as such are a highly variable species, having lived from the Iberian Peninsula to Java, and also were potentially the longest lived hominin species, living about nine times as long as our own species has been around. All of these factors have however made them controversial, with many scientists and others like myself having many conflicting ideas on how they should be classified, whether other hominin species should be lumped with them or split, or if the species should even be considered valid at all. The main discussion comes from whether different populations should be lumped or split depending on their location, with remains from Eastern and Southeast Asia being considered Homo erectus, Western Asia and Africa being Homo ergaster, and European remains as Homo heidelbergensis. Homo ergaster, roughly translating to working man, is the most divisive for many, as there are many arguments on both sides that could make either claim of lumping or splitting them being likely, so I'll go over the evidence and go over what I think, and although I may get some things wrong, hopefully it's explained in a way for you watching to also form an opinion as well, whether it differs or not. Those who believe Ergaster should be subsumed in Erectus consider there to be too little difference between the two to separate them into distinct species, and that any variation is just variation among individuals and populations. Those who think they should remain separate cite morphological differences between the African and Asian fossils, as well as clarifying that Homo evolution is more complex than what is implied by subsuming the two together, regardless of the correct classification. African specimens do exhibit more primitive versions of traits later expressed in specimens of Asia, and are thus likely the direct ancestors of later populations in Asia and across Europe. Overall, there is no doubt however that the group of fossils composing Erectus and Agaster represent the fossils of a more or less cohesive subset of closely related archaic humans, but instead whether these fossils represent a radiation of different closely related species, or the radiation of a single highly variable and diverse species over the course of 2 million years. A 2008 analysis examined the fossils of various species from both continents, and found that the intraspecific variation among them was greater than expected for a single species when compared to modern humans and chimpanzees, but fell well within the variation expected for a species when compared to gorillas, and even well within the range expected for a single subspecies when compared to orangutans, although this is primarily due to the great sexual dimorphism exhibited in these two species. From all of this evidence, I currently lean towards Agaster and Erectus being one in the same, just being variable populations that while being subtly different in appearance, were still closely related enough to be considered the same species, but we'll see with future studies as to how this all ends up. Their potential spread into Europe is also one of contention, with the species Homo heidelbergensis being the major player. 
Heidelbergensis is just as controversial as Augusta, if not more so, with them being thought to either be a population of European Homo erectus, or a descendant species that branched off from them, with me personally leaning more towards much of the specimens we do have being erectus. Although there are points of contention, and as such, because their classification is so disputed, the Middle Pleistocene is often called the Muddle in the Middle. Homo heidelbergensis is typically regarded as a chrono species, a species that involves continual and uniform changes from an extinct ancestral form on an evolutionary scale, which leads to populations forming that are physically, morphologically, or genetically distinct from their original ancestors. Because of this, and as they would have originated from an African form of Homo erectus, they are typically placed as the most recent common ancestor between modern humans and Neanderthals, around 800,000 through 350,000 years ago. After this point, Homo erectus did actually coexist at the same time as our own species, as well as possibly Homo floresiensis in Indonesia, although their time of existence was soon to be over. The latest record of morphologically recognisable Homo erectus known so far are the Soloman specimens from Java, which dates to around 117 to 108,000 years ago. The cause for their disappearance is an interesting one, as in 2020 research found that Homo erectus and Heidelbergensis populations had lost more than half of their climate niche, also around the same time the latest known fossils have been found, meaning that climate change likely played a substantial role in the extinction of these hominins. There is also archaeological evidence to suggest that just maybe, laziness was a factor as well, and that they use least effort strategies for tool making and collecting resources. The site covered in the Arabian Peninsula was formed around a big rocky outcrop of quality stone, around a small hill, which from what the researchers found, showed that instead of walking up the hill to acquire said stone, they would have instead used whatever bits had rolled down and were lying at the bottom. This is evidence from the lack of activity on the hill, with no evidence of artefacts or quarrying being found, so while they knew it was there, they instead just picked up materials whenever they just so happened to be there, and weren't pushing themselves to advance in their technology, hence why much stone tool technology around this point remains fairly stagnant. This is in contrast to the stone tool makers of later periods, including Uli Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, where evidence of them climbing mountains to find high quality stone and then transporting it over long distances being evident, quite the difference from Erectus. It's because of this that the study declared that this apparent laziness, couples with a rapidly changing climate, likely plays a role in their extinction, with sediment samples showing that the environment around them was changing rapidly, but they were largely staying the same throughout. This in many ways does display their more basal behaviour in how they operated, in that while they were advanced enough to recognise tools were an advantage, they did not yet operate under the same sense of opportunistic drive that we do today. Overall, Homo erectus, as you will have gathered throughout this video, are quite a complicated species, with a lot of research on them being hotly debated, and with there being many sides as to what species should be considered valid, what should be considered a synonym, and if they should even exist under their current taxonomy. Nevertheless, they were an incredibly successful group, nearly having a 2 million year existence, and spreading to places on the globe that hasn't yet been reached by our ancestors. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals, and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.